Some of you, if you're kind of regulars here, may have heard our speaker talk a couple of years ago. So our speaker is Garth Illingworth, who is Emeritus Distinguished Professor at UC Santa Cruz. He's world-renowned for his work on the earliest phases of structure, stars, galaxies in our universe. He started, as I mentioned, on globular clusters, old stars nearby. He then decided to push to looking back in time directly to higher and higher redshift galaxies, seeing galaxies not as they have evolved to now, which is what you do if you study the Milky Way, as we heard earlier in the Physics Cafe, but looking at galaxies when they were extremely young. That science is what Garth talked about a couple of years ago, and he talked about what he hoped to do with the James Webb Space Telescope. What Garth is going to talk about today is how that hope has turned into an expectation. They're planning to take the observations because James Webb launched incredibly successfully last December. Garth will give you updates, I think, on the unbelievable successes in getting it in place, getting all the optics working. But this was a real struggle to get James Webb to reality. Our speaker, Professor Rillingworth, was there right from the start. And he's going to be telling us today just what it takes to create something as transformational and incredible as James Webb. So thank you, Garth. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much, Rosie. Well, it's interesting. You reminded me of Globular Clusters. One of the very first papers I did was with my non-astronomer wife, actually. So there's an Illingworth and Illingworth paper on globular clusters, because she did so much of the hard work while we were trying to count and measure things. It took me back a few years. So today, as I will show you, is a, a real moment for Webb. And I got very enthusiastic, so I'm wearing my Webb socks. I have my Webb hoodie, the whole works, and even my Webb pin here. And let me show you why that's the case. And so today, NASA did a press release. And that press release said that we now have a telescope. Every one of the 18 segments on that telescope is now working together to make a single 6.5 metre, 21 foot mirror that delivers incredibly sharp images. So this is a real moment in the whole development and a demonstration that what we have been working for 20, 30 years is really coming to reality. So well, I'm going to be talking through a lot of the background here, but I did want to say a few words about this relative to Hubble. So Webb is an infrared telescope. So it works at much longer wavelengths than Hubble. Hubble, Hubble is basically optical. It sees what our eyes see, goes a little to the ultraviolet, goes a little to the infrared. Infrared is longer wavelengths, but with Webb, we really set out from the very beginning to work in the infrared. And the reason we did that is because working from the ground in the infrared is incredibly difficult. The sky in the infrared, even at night, is as bright as the daylight sky. And so you can imagine, if you're trying to study the distant universe, or almost anything in the universe, Working at daylight is extraordinarily hard. But if we can put a telescope in space and we can cool it well enough, then we can see as though it were night on the ground for the optical. So infrared is a crucial part of this. So let me now step along through this and let me tell you a little bit about the background in the last year and how we got to launch. And then I will come through various stages of the development of this telescope. So here is the last time we saw this telescope on the ground at Northrop Grumman in Los Angeles in Redondo Beach, fully opened out with the sun shield. So that's what it looks like, except the mirror wings are folded back. We never actually folded the wings out at the same time. We couldn't do that. 
But so this it had been done, of course, on the ground, but earlier. So here is what it looks like in the scale of it. There it's all folded up, ready for shipping. So our origami telescope is now in its most compact form, so we can ship it and we can put it on the rocket. So here is the shipping. It was all being worked in Los Angeles, and we had to get it to Kourou in French Guiana, which is where it was going to be launched by the Ariane 5 rocket. Ariane Sparse, that was the agreement with ESA, our partner in this, and Canada, the space agency, also partnered with us in this telescope. So here it is in its big container, an environmentally sealed container to keep it pristine. That and the truck went on this large ship. It went through the Panama Canal. As you can see, this little video running here. It's sort of cute to watch. The MN is the MN Calibri with our telescope on board. And then it arrived at uh, French Guiana. Truck and all came off the ship and took it to the launch site for processing, where it spent three months actually being checked out to make sure it was still OK, and then fueled up, et cetera, as I'll show you later. So it's had lots of journeys. Of course, it's flown around the US as well during testing and building. So three months at Kourou, checking it out, making sure everything is working still, then putting all the fuel on board, these guys in spacesuits, hydrazine, dangerous fuels that they're working with. So this is for the, all the thrusters on board that are essential to keep it where we need it to be. And then our $10 billion telescope is picked up by a single cable and lowered. I should, you know, sometimes people say dropped, but not quite. I hate to hear that word in this context. Lowered onto the top of the rocket. But every time I see it picked up like that, I get really nervous. And so now sitting on top of the rocket, and then the fairing being brought down to the Ariane 5 rocket and placed over it, then the rocket being taken out of the vehicle assembly building with web on top and then at the launch pad. And so this was the day, actually two days before Christmas. So then on Christmas morning, 7.30 a.m. Eastern time, actually 7.20, I'm sorry, absolutely on the dot, it went off. And at that point, Wendy and I were at Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, which was the home of mission control, where all the information flows down and the control is done through there. And one of the things they had were launch day cookies, which I really think are cute, and they're good cookies too. And you notice that the science goals uh, on each of these different cookies. So that was sort of fun as well, but the launch was what was it really about, and that was amazing. A truly flawless launch. Ariane Spass, the European provider, this was part of the contribution by ESA, was the launch vehicle, gave us an incredibly flawless launch. So I'm going to show you a little video, and you will see this is Webb, the back end of Webb after it's being released from the upper stage, and a very important uh, first deployment on Webb was when the solar panels came out. So let me just run this video, and you'll get an advert for ESA here. Oh, I may have to shut off the music. No, if there's no audio, that's good. So on the top of the rocket, Ariane, this is now showing Webb, attached to the upper stage with the camera that's on the upper stage, and the spring-loaded mechanism pushes it away. And so now it's moving away in space, as you can see with the Earth there, from the upper stage. And it's a, just beautiful to see this. This camera was not intended to be ever flown on this rocket, but ESA and Ariane Spass went to the, took a lot of effort to get it going and to put it on here the first time it was ever used on their rocket. And it was just wonderful to see. So we were all sitting here after a couple of minutes, or well, after the 10 minutes or so of launch, where the mission control manager kept saying nominal, which to anybody in the space business means it's going absolutely great. And so every time he would say that, there'd be sort of a cheer in the auditorium at Space Telescope. So it's heading out, and we were talking, and the commentator was talking about, well, in about six minutes, the solar array is going to deploy. And so we were watching this, thinking, oh, we probably won't get to see that, because it's going to be too far away. 
And so time was sort of ticking along and there was discussion and suddenly the commentator said, hey, the solar array's deploying early. And uh, so there it goes. This was crucial. The batteries on board only had a lifetime of several hours. So the solar array had to come out and quickly. And so all we had was that several hours. Luckily, after 70 seconds, it came out. And so there was a lot of sort of <laughs> scratching. How come it came out so quickly? And I asked the system engineer there, and he said, oh, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> so I thought, OK. So anyway, it turned out later that what had happened is fully autonomous. Ariane, again, did such an amazing job. If you've ever watched the simulation, as the upper stage moves out, it rocks back and forward to make sure that web is heated uniformly by the sun. So it's like being a chicken on a spit. And at the point that it's released, the orientation is crucial. What Ariane also did was really having a phenomenal launch where everything worked perfectly. They also positioned this web to release and go out just exactly right. And the onboard software went, huh, I don't have to do anything. We're already in the right place. Let's eject the array, and did. So that was incredible to see that. So by this point, the upper stage is starting to point away from web. We didn't want it following it out to L2. And so that's why it was moving off to the right. So then, over the next two weeks, we went through this incredible unfolding sequence, moving the arms down that contained the solar array, pulling out that solar array, um, tensioning it, unfolding the secondary mirror, and then bringing in the primary mirrors so that they, the primary mirror was complete. And then after two weeks, we had a fully deployed telescope. So that is, and I'll talk a little more about this in a moment, but that was a remarkable series of activities. And they'd been all tested on the ground, but ground is very different to space. So in parallel, while this was happening, Webb, of course, was moving out towards L2. And so this schematic shows Webb leaving and its 29-day voyage out to L2. During this time, Webb is not quite positioned to go to L2. And so use the onboard thrusters to accelerate it a little bit. And Webb can only accelerate. So you have to get it just right, because you never want to overshoot L2. Then you're in trouble. We can't go back to it. So we did a big 12 hours. We did a large burn with the propulsion system to get it on path, a little correcting one called MCC-1B. And then finally, one at two, MCC-2, which put it into this halo orbit around L2, a million miles from Earth, four times the distance of the moon. That's why I said not to scale. So what is so important about these burns was that that same fuel that was used in those burns is actually, was actually needed to be used for station keeping and operations and really set the life of Webb. And we'd set a goal of 10 years. It turns out that Ariane Spass did such an amazing job setting us on our trajectory, we didn't need to use much fuel. And so we now have a life of at least 20 years out here, which is wonderful, actually. So fuel is not a concern at this point. It'll be maybe other things, hardware failures or whatever else that can affect the life of a space telescope. It's a rough environment. Anyway, that was great. And so this little video just shows how Webb and the Earth moon go around the sun. And Webb is going in and out of the plane. So this is basically just to give you a sense of how it moves during that time. And we have to station keep to keep it there. We have to use a little bit of propellant to do that. So this is what Webb looks like. We don't have any photos, of course, where we can see this with any detail. So during that 29 days, there were 50 major deployments. There's nearly 300 single point failures on here. If any one of them had failed, we would have lost the mission. And particularly, there's 178 actuators which allow everything to move out. And uh, these non-explosive actuators are absolutely crucial. Every one of them worked perfectly. Again, single point failure. So everything worked. And while we were sort of delighted, we were also sort of worried because this is incredibly complex. And so 
there were, you know, feeling that, you know, whenever we did something, there might be a hiccup and we'd have to work around and try and get it to work. It never happened, essentially. One minor thing was a little bit slower than we expected. Everything else just worked perfectly. So we have a telescope that looks like this sitting out there now and being worked. And I'm going to mention to it earlier, it was called the Next Generation Space Telescope. The name was changed to Webb in 2002. So just to give you a sense of broadly what this is like. So this is what the schematic of the telescope. The light comes in from the universe on the left from your source, hits the big mirror, hits the little mirror, a couple of other mirrors, and goes into the instrument package where the photons are recorded on detectors, as uh, I think Alex was saying, CCDs or infrared detectors, big expensive versions like they're in our phones. And so also on spectrographs, and they did a great job of explaining spectrographs, so you're all up to speed on that. But basically spreading the light out and getting a lot more detailed information. So that's the instrument package with these four big instruments. Canada supplied one, the Europeans supplied nearly two, one and three quarters with some US contributions there, and the other one was a US instrument. So this has been a real international activity. Now, I also wanted to give you a sense of how we get to see the sky here, because you can't move the telescope relative to the sun shield or the um, spacecraft. It has to stay that way, because we need to always be blocking the sunlight. So if you look. On the right side there is the hot side, the, where the spacecraft is, and all the communications, power, and control systems. Telescope cold on the left, and the sun shield in between. And so I'm, this is where I desperately felt the need this afternoon for a model. So this is my current model of Webb, until I can buy one on Amazon that's big enough to actually show people. So basically, Webb, if the sun is coming from this direction behind me, Webb can rotate 360 degrees like this. And so then the telescope can point anywhere in a big arc around the sky. It can tilt back and forward by 50 degrees like this, and it can tilt a little bit this way. So that's the way we get to see with Webb pretty much anywhere on the hem part, hemisphere of the sky at any time. And then, of course, as you saw in that video, it goes around the sun, so that opens up a new segment of the sky. So over the year, we can see everything in the sky with Webb. And so that is really nice, because astronomical objects are everywhere, and interesting ones are all over the place. So, <coughs> excuse me. so here, to give you a sense of what we were having to do with this sun shield, unfortunately, folks give, you have to keep flipping your brain around, because they point all these figures in different directions. So now the sun is coming from the left instead of the right. And that's the hot side. So as I said, there's the solar panel there, which powers everything. Communications, the computational capability, the steering, the thrusters are all on that side. And also the cooler for the infrared instrument too, which I can mention later. And so we have this sun shield, there's five layers of extremely thin plastic capped on, coated with aluminum, silicon on the left-hand most um, uh, layers. And that has to cut down the heat flux incredibly. And in fact, the sun shield is a million SPF. So <laughs> it's a pretty good sunscreen. So about 200 kilowatts land on the left side there, and a fraction of what leaves on the right side. So it is amazingly good at stopping. And it's clearly been demonstrated. It really works. And so on the right side, sun is heating everything on the left and providing power. On the right side, the universe is being used as a giant refrigerator to cool it down. And I'll show you how much that has actually got cooled down. So here, from last week, the temperatures of the primary mirror. So at launch, this started off at room temperature. And within about a week of launch, when the sun shield was brought out, it started to cool down. Currently, these are Kelvin, absolute, above absolute zero. So that's actually cooled from room temperature to about minus 380 Fahrenheit on average. So it's pretty cold. And in fact, the secondary mirror up the top there is already 30 Kelvin, 30 degrees above absolute zero. And these mirrors are getting close to where they will be ultimately. 
There'll be a range always, but the goal was to get them in the range of about 45 degrees Kelvin, and they're already getting there. So the sun shield is working beautifully, and so that part of it is just great. And interestingly, so we also are now at the point where the instruments are being powered up and turned on, and particularly NERCAM, which is a camera that's crucial for doing all the uh, mirror alignment, and then there's the spectrograph, the European provided one, then the Canadian provided one are all cool and being powered up. And the FGS is the fine guidance sensor. That's what keeps Webb locked on a star or an object. And that is also being used now. So that in particular with NERCAM are what is actually being used. And there's a website called What is Webb where you can actually see the temperature of the very uh, items on web itself every day. They update the temperatures every day. And you can see they're pretty cold on the cold side, pretty warm on the warm side too. So when we sent this up after launch, we already knew that there was a huge amount of work to do to get this in shape for doing science. So there's a program of activities set up for deploying the telescope, for, you know, once we put it into L2, doing the commissioning of that telescope, which means aligning it and getting what we, I just showed you back there, and I'll show you a little bit more of that later. There's the pristine image of all the mirrors working together. And then the instruments, the science instruments, also need to be fully checked out and commissioned as it were, calibrated, et cetera. That whole timeline takes six months. There's actually a, a hugely detailed, 24-7 set of activities that are carried out to do this with something like 10,000 steps in 700 odd major categories. And we're about halfway through that at the moment. As I said, all the cameras are powered up and what's really happening now is that we're doing the mirror segment alignment and phasing to get our mirror and using a bright star to do that. And I'll show you sort of a couple of the steps of that because it's been fascinating to actually look at what we have to go through to do that. That takes quite a lot of time. Remember I said we deployed in two weeks. In the following two weeks, we moved all the mirror segments off their stops where they were held down during launch to stop damage. That took two weeks to do that. That was quite a big job and absolutely crucial. They, had to, they all had to move and every actuator had to work. And so now the optics team has been going through and working up the... Uh, to get the images. Now, of course, when a telescope like this goes up, as you saw, there's 18 segments in there, 1.3 meter segments and a secondary mirror. They've all been set up on the ground with some ground testing and also done cold, but there's uncertainties in there. There's no way we could set up on the ground under gravity exactly what was gonna be needed for space. But what was amazing, and so when we folks tried to do the very first star. They thought, well, we don't know where these mirrors are gonna be. So they started to take pictures with the onboard camera. And they spent 25 hours taking 156 pictures over an area that covered the size of the full moon because they thought each one of these segments might be showing an image anywhere in that big area. As it turned out, the segments were actually pretty well aligned and were pointing to just a small part of that big array that they did. And so that's the very first image ever taken through web. And so 18 little dots of lights, one for each segment. Some of them, as you can see, they're not very round. This is an early stage. And then, of course, they had to identify, so which mirror did these actually come from, which segment? So they would tweak them and see which one moved, and then they could put the numbers against them. Now, another part of the alignment process is actually taking what's called pupil images, where you look at the mirror and the illumination on the mirror. They took a pu pupil image, and one of those stars was act one of those segments was actually lighting up, and that was that particular segment there. So this was the first pupil image, the first sort of detailed image as well, of that uh, from that first star. So a week later, they now understood enough about the segments and it started to move them and they wanted to put them into this pattern which corresponded to what the actual layout of the mirror was. Then they could start trying to tweak those segments and the secondary mirror 
tilting it, moving it in back and forward, up and down. They have motions. They can do anything they want with these mirrors in terms of positioning. So they spent another week cleaning up the individual images. So each one of those segments was then actually making a nice little telescope in its own right. Then they could actually move all those and make one stacked image. But this is just a stacked image. It's the segments are not working together as a single telescope at that point. So you've got a big image, as it were, compared to what was ultimately needed. Getting them to be exact, such that this looks like a single smooth mirror for the incoming light, is a lot of work. And you saw this was February 25th. So it took another three weeks almost to actually get to the point where we saw this today. So this image was generated on March the 11th, I think so last Saturday, was it? Or Friday or whenever. And so this is, of course, what we've been waiting for. So we put up a telescope, which has got 18 pieces of glass or beryllium in there, and we want to make that look, act like one big telescope. And it does. It's not completely finished yet, but it's demonstrated that we can phase the mirrors, as it were, that we can align the segments accurately enough to make it look and work as a single telescope. So this is an absolutely amazing step along the path and a crucial one. There's more fine details that need to be done to optimize it across the whole of area where the instruments work. But, and that will probably take another month. But this gave us what we needed. And then, of course, we took a pupil image of the mirror, and now everything is nicely illuminated. So we're in great shape here optically. And uh, so our selfie image is there, web selfie. So we're at the point now where we're thinking down the road of the first science images. These are called early release observations. Every time NASA does a major upgrade or a new mission, it takes spectacular images that it hopes get on the front pages of the New York Times or get shown you know, 10 times a day on CNN or whatever. And so they will release those in June. They don't tell you what they're going to be. I have no idea. Even with my connections, I have no idea what they're going to be. And web science observations will then start probably in July. So just to give you a sense of the science that is broadly in people's minds about what this can do, and it's part of what we use to help convince Congress and the administration that this is really worth doing. At the top left there, I put what to me is the most interesting thing, is the unknown unknowns, the discoveries, exploring the unknown, as it were, that a new capability like this, this is hundreds of times better than any infrared telescope we've had before, a thousand times, probably closer, 100 times Hubble in many ways. So it will certainly find things that will go, wow, we didn't know that, we didn't expect that. But at the same time, we also have a long list of key science objectives. And so we want to find the earliest galaxies in the universe. We want to map how galaxies have grown over the 13.5 billion years that they have been forming to our Milky Way today. What, what's the assembly of galaxies like? We want to look, and particularly in the infrared, we can see through dust. And so we want to look much more closely at how stars and their planet birth and uh, you know, are brought about. And then, of course, we want to use this telescope to see if we can learn more about the exoplanets that we now have found. So these are the primary science goals. But of course, the astronomy community comes up with great science, and it goes through a process and is chosen to do the things that uh, collectively you know, the, the, the committees feel is the best thing to do at the time for Webb. But there's no doubt that seeing first galaxies has been a key sales point of this telescope from the very beginning. And JWST can reach back through 95, 98.5% of all time in all likelihood. It's amazing to think about that, almost at the beginning of time in the universe. And so just a few, couple of hundred million years after the Big Bang. And of course, the question is, you know, is this enough to see the first galaxies forming? And by first galaxies, I mean, you probably there's stars form and then galaxies start to form and grow. There'll be a point where we will never be able to see that with Webb. There's just too little light there. But as we will, if we can map it back to within a couple of hundred million years, I think we'll be doing great. 
And so the question is maybe, of course, we don't know. That's what part of the exploration is about. And so I was interested when, two, three years ago, when I gave the talk about distant galaxies, I showed this object, which is the most distant galaxy that we've found with Hubble. And it's uh, 400 billion years after the Big Bang, looking back through 13.3 billion years, through 97% of all time. Amazing that Hubble and the Spitzer Telescope ever found an object like this. And I said, this is probably the most distant confirmed galaxy until Webb flies. Still the case. So soon we will reach out further, though. So it certainly won't be the case for very much longer. So how did we get to this point? So 35 years ago, we started talking about this in Baltimore. And the reason we did was, I heard this one morning, and it was, start working on the next big mission. It will take a very long time. And so it was the Space Telescope Science Institute director who said that to me, Riccardo Giacconi. He subsequently got the Nobel Prize for his work on X-ray telescopes. Hubble wasn't even launched at this point, and we were many years before launching it and had huge problems. And I said to Riccardo, no, nah, we can't do this. We've got so much to do on Hubble. And he said, trust me, you just got to do this because it'll take a long time. And at that point, we didn't expect Hubble to last more than about 15 to 20 years. And so that's the sort of time scale you need to actually do a new mission. So a number of us there began to develop this concept. And the concept was a passively cooled, a very cold, infrared, very large, 8 to 10 metre space telescope, well away from the Earth. And while Webb has evolved over time, it's got a bit smaller and so on, the basic concept has remained the same. So here's this from the mid-90s photo here. There's Ricardo standing there and me in the right when I had colour in my hair. And uh, Peter Stockman, the other guy, played a major role in this. The engineer Pierre Ballou, who wasn't in this photo, but Pierre in his office there, incredibly bright guy, amazingly capable guy. He actually came back to Baltimore from France to be at uh, the Institute during the launch morning. And that was great, actually, that he could do that. So he had written one of the early papers about this, uh, doing a big telescope like this. And so we were basically conceptualizing what comes beyond Hubble before Hubble, which is sort of interesting when you think about it. Hubble was clearly going to change the dynamics and the game and understanding of astronomy. So you had to come up with something that was going to really be worth doing following Hubble. But as it turned out, I think that this turned out to be the right thing and it was the right thing to do since we have now been spending 20 years and $10 billion on it. So basically, we had the first workshop in 1989 at Space Telescope Science Institute with support from NASA as well at that time. And we were talking about big telescope in space and an even bigger one on the moon and uh, talking about the science and the technologies and the challenges and so that was a sort of, a, and this was a year before Hubble was launched. And at that time, it's interesting, I just grabbed a couple of these. We were already talking about finding Earth-like galaxies, uh, Earth-like planets. Nobody knew if exoplanets existed at this point. It was sort of suspected they probably would be. But we were talking about what would we need to do to look at an Earth-like, find an Earth-like planet and see if it had life on it. So that was being talked about 35 years ago. We were also talking about very distant galaxies, though we had almost no idea of how distant distant was. And so, but we thought that this was going to be a key factor, was trying to understand how galaxies formed and grew. So this, these basic science concepts lay in there as well as working through and talking about the concept itself. And so there was an important discussion which happened in the decadal survey. Astronomers every 10 years get together, big effort, and come up with their priorities for the future. And there are panels that work different areas, and then it's consolidated by a, prior, a, a sort of top-level committee. So one of the panels that I chaired recommended a telescope like this. And we said probably two, to that, $2 billion and could be launched in 2009. The overall committee decided, no, this was too, too far out and had other priorities. So it didn't go beyond this other than finding this and identifying it. 
But we also kept following up on this and did a technology workshop. AstroTech 21 was a program at NASA headquarters for looking at technologies needed for future missions across a wide range of areas. So we used that through JPL and started discussing the technologies that were going to be key to this and had a workshop with a lot of great people. I was just looking back at it a while ago and it's very impressive actually what was being said there. But Things sort of flattened out for a little while, partly because there was a recession and we were also having problems. Hubble, of course, had failed. Its optical system was not uh, properly uh, tuned up. It mirror had been badly polished or wrongly polished. It had been perfectly polished to the wrong figure. So there was a lot of effort and concentration on trying to fix Hubble. After Hubble was fixed, this field was done by Bob Williams, the director at the Institute. 10-day exposure with Hubble. And this just blew everybody away. The amazing number of galaxies that were here, the Hubble Deep Field. This sort of cemented the dynamics for the future big mission because everybody realized Web, uh, sorry, NGST would be able to do this in a spectacular fashion. And in fact, I did a calculation just a little while ago, Web can do this in six or seven hours and better, absolutely better. So its gain is really there. So the pathway forward, though, it's not there's sort of a number of steps that have to happen before there's actual support to doing something like this mission. A key study was something called the HST and Beyond study that was done in the earliest 90s. And uh, they recommended a number of things to do with Hubble, to do with an infrared telescope and interferometry, a different type style of telescopes, and recommend a four meter or larger aperture. There was a, an interesting aspect of this that when this was being discussed, the NASA administrator was giving a presentation to a large group of hundreds, actually probably more than a thousand astronomers, and uh, said, I see Alan Dressler here. All he wants is a four meter optic that goes from half a micron to 20 microns. And I said to him, why do you ask such a modest thing? Why not go after six or seven meters? Well, hallelujah. <laughs> he, that was exactly what we needed. And of course, Dan was, being the administrator, was you know, interested in moving forward on this. And I think it was soon that you know, the folks in NASA got together and talked about it. And Ed Weiler, who was the administrator for the science part of NASA at that time, asked John Mather to lead a small effort at Goddard Space Flight Center to look into this. And John later got a Nobel Prize for his work too, not on this, on um, a, uh, what was it? COBE. COBE was the uh, microwave background mission. And so Dan was also now supportive of eight billion, an eight meter telescope, which was great, but uh, which was pretty much consistent with what we'd been talking about earlier. But he said, it's should cost $500 million to construct. So I'll come back to that much later, more later. So of course, I was absolutely delighted with this change. I thought four meters was politically a disaster. Whenever you do a mission like this, you cost out to do that particular scale and things happen. <laughs> things go wrong and you get cut and you get descoped. And I did not want to start out at four meters. If we'd end up smaller, three meters Hubble-like in the infrared, that would have been just too small for the science, and even four meters was too small. So fortunately, we got on a path of the eight meters. So now NASA was more involved, and there was a big study involving folks in NASA and the community and in industry looking at what one may be able to do, how one may be able to do a mission like this on the six to eight meter scale from a couple of big companies and from Goddard. And also now realizing that it may well be possible to do this with a deployable system instead of trying to have one solid system like uh, Hubble is with a solid telescope, solid mirror. So and this, of course, was the time where the, cons the feeling of the core science case was really first stars and galaxies. Very important to have something that's exciting and easy to sell. As has been often said, when you go to Congress to talk to people, if you can't write it on the back of a postage stamp, you'll never get it across. It's the classic elevator statement. You get on one floor and somebody says, what are you doing? And in the next 10 seconds, you've got to get them excited. So this 
is what was routinely used. So in the end of the 90s, Ed Weiler, the administrator of science, signed this weird name document, formulation authorization document, a very important step. It's the formal start of phase A at NASA. So this and sort of initiated NGST as a mission, as a project. But politically, it was also crucial that the next decadal survey, I was involved with the 1990, that the 2001 say that this was high priority, otherwise it wouldn't have gone forward. And they did. They said it's the most important thing we can do as astronomers that NASA can do for us is to do NGST as an eight meter telescope. And they said it might cost a billion dollars. If you remember, our estimate in 1990 was two billion or 2.6 billion now, so I was pretty, many of us, I would say, not just me, were pretty skeptical of the cost. So, at that point, we have a mission that we're starting. Now, how do we get to 2022 and launch? So slowly, painfully, and at great expense. I think I mentioned $10 billion several times. That's where we ended up. And we started at one. And you don't go through increases like that without a huge amount of effort and grief. But meanwhile, the people involved in this project over the couple of decades that it's been active are incredibly capable. The engineers, the scientists involved. So, you know, there have been problems, and you'll see some of that, but it is an astonishingly capable group of people. So, NGST started in 2001. The D scope occurred. People realized that, wow, we're never going to be able to build an eight meter. I'm not sure we can even deploy it properly, et cetera. So they descoped the six and a half. So just what I was thinking about with regard to four, et cetera. TRW was selected as the prime contractor through a competition. Ultimately, they're bought out by Northrop Grumman. So you'll hear about Northrop Grumman from now on. And it was, remain, it was renamed James Webb Space Telescope by the administrator at that time. And it went into phase B around that point where now it's getting much more real. There's money being spent on it, hardware being planned out, and even some things being built and acquired. But it was an incredibly rocky path after that in the first 10 years. So almost immediately, every year, budget problems arose. It was clearly not scaled correctly in terms of cost. Mike Griffin, the administrator who came in and actually sent the a shuttle mission back to Hubble agreed to do that, was a great guy, very innovative and very and sort of driven to do things. And he found JWST was just, he said, it's under cost that this mission has got real, real problems. And this was during discussions that we had with him on the Astronomy Astrophysics Advisory Committee that I was chairing at that time. So every year NASA was trying to increase the budget. Unfortunately, and this continued for five years, it went into its phase C. KPC was held in July of 2008. NASA thought they had it better under control in terms of budget. And so now we're going into the fabrication phase. And so there was actually excellent progress in those early five years. There was real good progress on some new technologies and on the mirrors, which was started early because everybody knew they were a great challenge. But there were serious budget issues still, even after phase C. And the Office of Management and Budget and Congress were getting really unhappy and uh, worried about where this was going. So there was a, at that point, the launch date was 2014. It slipped out from 29, 2009 to 2011 to 2014. And the cost had grown to $4 billion to, uh, to get to launch. But given the changes every year, the estimates from NASA were just not credible. And the cost growth and the slips were raising the specter that Congress could just kill it. And they are the ones who control the budget for these missions. So Senator Mikulski from Maryland was great. She just loved Hubble, was a great supporter of what these missions could do for STEM, for the country, for its visibility and Goddard Space Flight Center was in Maryland, so she was also supported from a more practical level as well. And she was worried that it could get killed in Congress and she wouldn't be able to save it. And so she requested, and requested I put in quotes there because it was, you know, you're gonna do this. 
set up an independent review and tell us what's going on here and what it's going to take to do this right. So this committee was set up with a, a small, actually a pretty small committee. We had sort of two and a half months to do this. And uh, these were really capable project managers who had big mission experience across NASA, incredibly smart guys. I was the only astronomer on this for a variety of reasons, but anyway. So the report that we wrote was really direct and hard hitting. And I think at that, and often you don't find that. People sort of you know, whitewash it and make it a bit loose and so on. We thought we just have to tell it like it, we see it. And so I think without this report and what subsequently happened, we probably would have died. The animosity in Congress was pretty high. So we made a bunch of recommendations. NASA said, OK, we accept all of them. The key ones were you've got to get the handle on what the budget is and the schedule is going to be. So do a proper cost estimate. And what you have to do is make sure you have enough reserves so they can fix problems. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And also, this could kill the agency. If you fail on this after we've spent four or five billion dollars, this is the sort of thing that gives you a huge black eye. And so it has an impact at a higher level than just science. So I, killing the agency is not really, it's probably an overstatement, but it could do serious damage to their ability to get funding for other things. And so we also said, make sure that the administrator is in the line of command here, that it doesn't just go to science. And so NASA did that. So why did we get into the, why did we, the, why did this mission get into that situation? One, the budget was too low, you've seen that. There was a lack of reserves, so they didn't have enough money to fix problems as they arose. And they were developing bunches of technologies too late into the mission, which was not good. And then this particular item, which relates to number two as well, defer of work at crucial times. So what I learned, because I didn't have that experience from this from the project managers, is if you're in a problem situation or you're in a mission where you have very complex things that you're doing and there are several activities going on where the, the team lead comes to you and says, I need more money. We have to fix this or we have to design that. And you get several of these in a year and you don't have enough reserves, so you say, I can't do it as a project manager. I'll do this one, you defer those. What the project manager said <coughs> here was that if you do that, you're going to raise the cost, not by 10, 20% of doing those things, by factors of three, typically. So it just becomes uncontrollable. If you're doing this every year, the mission costs are just going ballooning sky high, and the schedule is going to hell as well. So you cannot do a mission in any reasonable way there. <coughs> so what they said was, what we said was, when we did a quick estimate to give Congress an idea of what it was going to take, we thought it would take two more years to launch and they had to add another billion and a half. But NASA had to do that, costs and schedule analysis. So Congress and the Office of Management and Budget were not happy at this at all because they saw that they had a, a problematic future ahead. So but NASA did step up to the plate and do pretty much everything we recommended and did the cost study. Six months later, they came back and said, well, you guys were a bit under. It's actually going to cost $8 billion to launch, and we're not going to get there until 2018. And so lots more money in reserves. But what, of course, they said was, you're going to need $500, $600 million for many years to be able to do this. And so both the Office of Management and Budget and Congress went, oh, no. <laughs> That's a, a lot of money, a big change. So, and you needed it quickly that every delay was going to add to the total. So we got into this situation. JWST was killed. There, the chairman of the House Appropriations Subcommittee that dealt with NASA and other agencies said, the bill also terminates funding for James Webb. And I remember the date and pretty much the time when I learned that on the 7th. I thought, oh, no. And there were people who were thinking that oh, Mikulski will save it. But the folks I talked to who are staffers and so on in Congress said, you cannot trust that to happen. You have to make sure that you put in a huge effort to recover this. 
So we had support from Nobel laureates, a lot of people. We also got great support from physicists because they'd been there in the 90s with the superconducting super collider where over $2 billion then, which is, you know, by now was more like $3 billion, had been spent and that was cut, killed. So but unfortunately, we had senior astronomers who were saying, oh, this is great, kill it, we'll get the money and do other things with it, which is completely naive, absolutely naive. They weren't going to get the money, it would go somewhere else. But anyway, the challenge we had was that we had mixed support in the astronomy community. So there was a lot of misinformation going around too, which was really annoying. And of course, we know about misinformation these days, it's sort of endemic in so many different areas. So you try to put together things to say what reality is in this case. But I think we had enough support from the science community to help get it back. But I think ultimately what really have mattered to the folks in Congress was that public support was already there for Webb, which is absolutely amazing in my view. I mean, years before launch, we had planetarium groups, we had school kids, teachers and so on. I remember an email I got from a teacher in Kansas saying, you know, how can I help? I thought, that's, that's incredible. So <coughs> ultimately, this made the difference. And so Chairman Wolf decided, okay, <coughs> excuse me, let me have a drink, um, that uh, he would support it and with a little negotiation with Senator Mikulski about some things he wanted. In the end, the conference language came back and said, yea, verily, you can do it, but not a penny over $8 billion or, or it's going to die. And so we'll come back to that a little later too. <laughs> so, but anyway, at that point, we had good progress on this for the next five years. The telescope and its instruments were all being put together at Goddard. They went through a major test, which I'll show you in a moment. And then the spacecraft and the Sunshield were being built up at Northrop, so two parallel paths of activity here. And so this was an absolutely crucial aspect of it. A vacuum test, taking it down to the temperature it was going to see in space. This is just the optics and instruments now. We, there's no way to practically test a full-up web with a range of temperatures on the ground. Impossible. So we had to do it in segments, as it were. And so it was taken down to Houston, this monstrous chamber that was originally built for Apollo program. It was set up, optical system put in there to test the optics. We didn't want another Hubble problem. We wanted to make sure optically it was good. So it was cooled down to 45 degrees above absolute zero. Three-month program. In the middle of that, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas and looped around, came back to Houston, dropped 17 inches of rain in two days. And right at the point where this was at its coldest, there was three foot of water around the building. Nobody could, the people who were working it were living in the building and trying to keep things operational. And there was a crisis at one point because there was running low on liquid nitrogen. The chamber needed liquid nitrogen and liquid helium. It was okay on helium, not on liquid nitrogen. So one of the guys down there managed to find a trucker who was willing to bring in tanks of liquid nitrogen through three feet of water. And otherwise we would have had to warm it up and then go through the whole cycle again. So that was um, exciting is not quite the right word, but anyway. So three months in there, cooled down to about the operational temperature, and things just were, worked beautifully. It was very impressive to see how well this was going at that point. So in parallel, of course, at Northrop, the Sunshield was being built. And so this is, it's amazing to look at this thing. So this is Kapton, and this is um, 25 microns and 50 microns, two at 50, one at 25. So these are, um, that's like a 20, so that's like two thou plastic. And these are going to be in space for decades. They are aluminized, capped on, incredibly flimsy, but also very tough, thank goodness, because they had to be handled a lot. So five layers of this stuff is what we have up there for our sun shield, and amazingly it all worked. I mean, we're convinced when, at the end of the process last year, that it looked good that it looked okay, things were working, 
But, you know, with floppy materials like this, it's not that predictable. It's not like building hardware, you know, welding up metal, building carbon fiber epoxy structures. Anyway, so this was worked up and took many years of effort. There were some problems, too, with this as well. But the deployment also was scary. I actually listed there are 139 release mechanisms, there's 70 assemblies, there are hinges, eight deployment motors, 400 pulleys, 90 cables totaling a quarter of a mile to actually get this thing to work and pull out and tension. And it all worked in space, which, uh, you know, we were hopeful as it were and probably pretty optimistic that we'd done all what was needed, but it was still an incredible uh, challenge to take this into space and have it all work. So right around 2018, of course, the Things were coming together. We brought the optical system from Houston, flew it across, and put it in the same clean room. And then there is the uh, spacecraft structure at the bottom and the two pallets that hold the sun shield that Northrop had been working. They had to be integrated together. So after five good years of progress, some issues started to arise. And early in 2017, there were leaks in thruster valves on the spacecraft. This was, just at the time, it was a disaster, really, because these had to be repaired, and taking them off was not easy, and would have required a lot of disassembly, but they needed to be welded on a spacecraft full of very tricky electronics. It took months to do this, so that was a schedule impact. Then the sun shield was starting to, we were starting to find rips and tears in the sun shield. And then, after testing, the spacecraft and the sun shield together by putting it on a vibe table and putting it in the acoustic chamber where you bombard it with a noise that's going to feel or hear in the rocket, Sue's nuts and washers fell out. So, and there were a thousand of these things in there. So we had to go through and do a check on all these. So the Northrop had to go through and do this. So these things were starting to impact the schedule. And interestingly, every one of those in its own right sort of seems pretty small. But now you've got, you know, a, an $8 billion program and little things that go wrong that impact that have huge cost impacts and schedule impacts. So small things matter a hell of a lot on big projects. So there was an announcement of delay in launch, which was uh, traumatic for everybody, of course, because uh, an uh, independent review board was set up to do this and to see what it was going to take to fix things and get us back on track. Um, you know, they were very good in the sense of emphasizing that for a mission like this, you've got to make it work. So mission success was absolutely central. But the reality was it was going to cost more money. So now we had to go back, and the estimate was after NASA did another assessment, another $800 million was needed in a couple of years. And so we set it for launch for, actually it was three years later at that point. And so as you can expect, Congress was really unhappy again, but we're so far into this program that basically I said, okay, just don't go over the 800 million and stay within the $8.8 .8 billion cap. So actually progress after that, after a very careful audit was done, and there was a much better integration of the NASA and the Northrop teams with their different cultures and abilities to working issues. And it was a, really a, quite a great change that I saw there in the way progress and the testing and the way folks work together. And so the next few years I thought went extremely well. So then we launched and now we have a telescope. So we're in great shape at this point. So, $10 billion. <laughs> so here we are, <laughs> our cosmic sunrise telescope, at least from my perspective. There are people who work on planets are gonna think different things about this. You know, it's an observatory. It will do a, a huge range of things. And let me also thank uh, the Nick and Maggie DeWolf Foundation as well for supporting this series of activities for so many years now. So, thank you all. I did run over a bit. I'm sorry, I tend to talk too much. <laughs> so questions? Let me stand a little away from the light here. 
Sure. Um, what issues are there with the point? So, like, the one kid said off that they can't have this um, telescope because the real one not had it? No. <laughs> I mean, we were, there were some concerns about security. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question was about a decoy ship. So the real one and another ship, which was uh, thought to be a decoy. And uh, no, that wasn't the case. The, there was concerns about advertising it too widely. So NASA never made a public announcement at the point that it was put in the container, well, I saw it put in the container, but then it was put on a truck and taken down on the 405 through LA, down to the port at five and 10 mile an hour. So you can imagine on there, 405, this upset a lot of people, but fortunately it was at night. They did it in the middle of the night. Huge police escort. It was taken down to the port and then put on the boat. The boat left. It was not mentioned anywhere. I mean, in the project, folks sort of knew that it had happened. And, you know, there probably was some monitoring going on. I don't know a lot of the background there. But basically, the ship just sailed off, went through the Pamina Canal. And it was interesting because people had, some folks had learned that, the name of it. And so, of course, you know, you can go online and find out, oh, where is this ship? And so they were tracking it, just like folks track airplanes for Elon Musk, et cetera, to see where he's going. So the same sort of tracking was happening, and somebody said, oh, it's in the Panama Canal when they saw the cameras there. So it was sort of out there, but it wasn't announced in any particular way. And once it got into Kourou, NASA set up and, and did a press release and saying, yeah, we're here, it's all looking great, and et cetera. So. But yeah, security was sort of an issue at times with this because it is a big investment. Ah, oh, yep, okay. The light's in my eyes, and so I think I need to stand over here. So the first part was about the alignment of the mirrors and why it can't be done observationally, computationally. oh, computationally. So let me answer that part, and then you can tell me what the second part was. So we're nowhere near it. You know, we're talking about stepping these mirrors around the 10 nanometers level, you know, thousands, thousands of uh, size of a human hair. And so we know where they are, but we don't know, you know, exactly where the surface is relative to all that. You really have to do it as a closed loop on a star. And, you know, even doing it on the ground in a testing facility, you just don't have the accuracy and the repeatability of the structures there. So I think we and the, pro and the folks, the optical guys, were absolutely delighted that they were as close as they were. And so it only took a month of effort, quote only, but actually it was pretty short given the number of steps in there that have to be done in terms of phasing the mirrors and in tilting and so on. So, but yeah, it has to be done on an external source. Oh, I, in fact, you're right there. That is correct. So once they kn knew where the images were, then they could move the mirrors to tilt and bring them together. And so, you know, they would put in an offset on the actuators to actually bring it to make that stacked image. But I bet also that it also had some iterations as well. I know there's a little sort of neat little program where they do it in steps. They bring it into a tighter and tighter arrays and then they sort of pop it into place. It's not completely deterministic. <laughs> the next big idea. So there's another mission currently being worked, which is like a sort of super hovel. It, in fact, uses one of the same mirrors from the NRO and the same style of mirrors as Hubble's mirror. And so that's going to be a wide field Hubble. So take big field images instead of the little ones, that pointed ones that Hubble takes. And that's called the Roman Space Telescope. Originally, it was called W first. That'll probably launch later in the decade, 2027-ish 20, uh, time frame. But the, really the next big one is, and this sort of 
is another thing that has been worked now for a, quite a while in the community talking about this. And the decadal survey just met recently and said that we give high pri highest priority in space to doing a mission which is a Hubble a JWST sized telescope, but now designed to search for planets, to characterize planets, to understand what the planets are like. So it's part of this search for life on planets. That's an incredibly challenging project because now the optical performance of the mirror and the system, the stability required, becomes hundreds of times more difficult to do than with Webb, which is an infrared telescope. So it'll require a very substantial investment and in development of technologies. So that'll probably, you know, knowing how long these things take, I, that won't fly before the end of the next decade, I suspect. I think there was a question down here, was there? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. If you describe what you mean, is it something that there's actually a gravitational reason that it's going to be going back there? Yeah, so it's this quasi stable region just because of the sort of gravitational um, configuration the Earth, the Sun, the Moon, etc. And so there are a number of these Lagrange points around the sun around them, the Earth's orbit and an inner one and so on. But L2 is a nice one because it's well about away from the Earth and you can, you know, and you go around with the Earth so you eventually get to see the whole sky. It's being used by a number of missions already. And so there's a Gaia mission, which you might have seen a little bit. That's in L2. And then uh, WMAP, I think, was there. Planck and Herschel were there as well. So the Europeans have used it more than we have. But uh, it's just a great place for these missions, especially if you want something that's stable and cold. It's, as I said, it's quasi-stable. So we're in a halo orbit around that, and we have to keep every three weeks or so do some station keeping to keep it there as well. Sure, sorry about that. There's a lot of terminology that just gets washed by in this. Yes? Is that geostationary? Sorry? Is that the... Geostationary? Uh, no, it's way beyond geostationary. Geostationary is between us and the moon. In fact, only about 20,000 miles, if I remember, 22 or something like that. And the moon, you know, is at um, whatever it is, 400,000 kilometers, so 250,000 miles. And this is at... L2 itself is actually at uh, a million miles out from us. Back there and then this one. Yeah, so the question is about the pointing and how rapidly it can be done with web and then how quickly it could find a, another target if something interesting goes off like a supernova or something like that or gravitationally lensed object. So not that quickly. It's massive. It has The whole body has to move. As I sort of did my little schematic, you know, you have to rotate it, you may have to tilt it. And so... You know, the reaction wheels on board, which are these fast spinning massive wheels that actually do the pointing, are uh, used to, you know, sort of as Newton did, you offset that, you want to go to a place, you speed up some wheels, you slow them down and the telescope reacts and goes there. So it is planned that there will be targets of opportunity, but it will take a while, so it's not a rapid change mission by any means in terms of its pointing. And I can't remember what the TOO time is. It might be a couple of weeks even to do that. Does anybody, do any of you guys know? Yeah, I sort of have this dim recollection of being a couple of weeks. Yeah, but that's usually within um, a day or two or three days. Oh, for, but that must be a very small offset. Yeah, that's really small. I mean, sort of an arbitrary one. I was thinking weeks. Yeah. So I think there was a question. Ah, yes, you. <laughs> yeah, well, I've had my moments. Oh, launch day was, you know, I didn't get much sleep that night. And, uh, and the other thing was the sun shield deployment. You know, you saw all the mechanisms and the motors and cables, and I'd 
walked around the sun shield, the model they had, not the flight, because you had to dress up, and I've never gone in the clean room, but they had a full-scale model. And I walked around that, and I looked at the cables, and I thought, no, oh, no, <laughs> is this all going to work? But yeah, it did, thank goodness. But yeah, that was a, that couple of weeks, there were a number of times in there where I was, oh, hallelujah, it worked. <laughs> Well, I think that's a good time to, uh, <laughs> or a good point on which we should stop. But please thank Garth again for, well, I think it's a really stimulating <laughs> talk. Thank you very much. It's great to be able to come and talk about it to, with you.